Gacy assaulted and murdered 33 young men and boys here in Illinois in the 70s. The bodies of 27 of those victims were found buried in the crawl space of Gacy's home. Gacy was arrested and sentenced to death for those murders. He died by lethal injection in 1994 at the age of 52. Welcome to Tyler Madero's TV. For those of you that are new, make sure you subscribe and turn on post notifications so you don't miss it when I upload. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the strangest last meal requests on death row. The person we're going to be talking about today is a man who you may know as the Killer Clown. John Wayne Gacy, born March 17, 1942 in Chicago, Illinois. He was the second born into his family and the only boy. Gacy's mom was a stay-at-home housewife and his father was a World War I veteran and would then become an auto repair shop mechanic. It was Gacy's grandparents that immigrated to the United States, where the family would then stay. Gacy had a close relationship with his two sisters, along with his mother. But Gacy didn't have much of a relationship with his father, who was an alcoholic and at times would be physically abusive. It seemed John Gacy would be picked on by his father and belittled. Even though John was mistreated by his father, he still respected him. John would constantly feel that he would never be enough in the eyes of his father. At the age of seven, John, along with another boy, was caught sexually assaulting a young girl. That same year, a family friend would molest John. John was too scared to say anything because his fear was that his father would blame him. What many of you may not know is that John Wayne Gacy had a heart condition from a very young age and was told to not take part in any athletic activities. By the time John was in grade four, he began to experience blackouts, which would result in him being hospitalized at times. It's estimated that John had missed a year of school in total due to his hospital visits and that resulted in the decline of his grades. John's father had doubts about John's health scares and would go on to say that he believed it was to gain attention and sympathy. His father would openly accuse John of faking his health condition. The people around John Wayne Gacy never doubted his condition, but the interesting thing is that health professionals never made an official diagnosis of his condition. By 1960, John would become involved in politics at the age of 18. Many speculated that John took part in politics due to him searching for an acceptance that he never received at home from his father. That year, John's father would actually buy him a car, but hold it over his head. And when John wouldn't do what his father wanted, he would take the keys away from John. John would then go on to purchase another set of keys for the vehicle. When his father found out, he then took a mechanical part out of the car to keep it from starting, so John wouldn't be able to use the vehicle. Three days later, John's father would return the part to the vehicle, where at that point, John Wayne Gacy left the home with the car and drove to Las Vegas, Nevada. Well in Las Vegas, John would find a job working with the ambulance service. He would then get transferred and work as a mortuary attendant. During that time, John would sleep behind the embalming room on a small cot. John would work at the mortuary for three months where he observed the embalming of dead bodies. Later on in John's life, he would go on to confess that one evening well in the mortuary, he climbed into a casket with a dead body. 
after he did that, there was something in him that was guiding him to call his mother. So John called his mother, asking if his father would allow him to return home. Not long after, John Wayne Gacy would return back to his home in Chicago. When John returned back to his home and enrolled into the Northwestern Business College, even though he never graduated high school, in 1963, John would graduate and would find a job as a management trainee with a shoe company. One year later, he would be transferred to Springfield, Illinois, where he worked as a salesman. John would then go on to get promoted to manager of his department. Later that same year, John would get engaged to a co-worker, Marlon Myers. During the engagement, John would go on to join the United States Junior Chamber, an organization where they taught you business development and management skills. By April of 1964, John Wayne Gacy would be named the key man. That same year, John would get married in the month of September. By the next year, John would receive a promotion to vice president of the Springfield Department of the organization. That same year, he would also be named top three outstanding employees for the organization in the state of Illinois. Now, the father of his wife owned three KFC restaurants in Waterloo, Iowa, and John and his wife were set to move with the understanding that the couple would be moving into the parents' home, which had been vacant for them, so John would be able to manage the restaurants. John would receive a salary of $15,000 per year, which in today's day would be over $120,000. John would also receive a share in the profits of the restaurant. After John completed his management course, the couple would make the move. While in Waterloo, Iowa, John Wayne Gacy opened a social club in his basement, where the employees would be able to mingle, have drinks, and play pool. It's said that even though John employed teenagers of both sexes at the restaurants, John would only socialize with the young men he employed. Well under the influence, John would make advances towards the young men, and if he would be turned down, he would play it off as if it was simply a joke and a test. By the year 1966, John's wife would give birth to a baby boy and the following year give birth to a baby girl. At that point in his life, John finally felt like he earned his father's approval and would describe his life in that moment as being perfect. John's father apologized to him while shaking his hand saying, Son, I was wrong about you. Well in Waterloo, Iowa, John joined the local United States Junior Chamber once again and would invest many hours into the organization along with the 12 to 14 hour days he worked managing the restaurants. People in the organization held John to a high standard. For his great fundraising work in 1967, John would be named Outstanding Vice President of the Waterloo Department of the organization. The same year, John would go on to be the board of directors for the organization where him and other members were heavily consumed in prostitution and drug use. In August of 1967, John would sexually assault an underage male who was the son of a fellow member of the organization. John would go on to sexually assault several other young men over the next few months. In March of 1968, the son of the fellow organization member would express to his father what had taken place with John Wayne Gacy. At that point, the father went to officials and John would be arrested and charged with sexual harassment. John would publicly deny the claims and state that the accusations were a politically charged move due to John being nominated for president of the Iowa chapter of the organization. Even though many fellow members of the organization found John's assumption credible, it was on May 10th of 1968, John Wayne Gacy would be indicted for the sexual allegations. John Wayne Gacy would then go on to persuade one of his young employees to assault the father of the young man involved in the case against John Wayne Gacy. He would promise the young employee $300 
the employee would lure the man to an isolated park where he was sprayed with mace and then beat. The man survived the assault and would later report the crime to officials. The following day, the man who conducted the assault was arrested and would initially deny any involvement in the attack. He would soon after admit to the attack and state that he had done so upon John Wayne Gacy's request. Officials would then arrest John and lay additional charges for hiring the young man to assault John's fellow organization member in the attempt to intimidate the man. John would then be ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation where he would be examined by two doctors over a seven day period where they would conclude John had antisocial personality disorder and John was unlikely to benefit from any therapy or medical treatment and his behavior was to bring him into repeated conflict with society. The doctors would also conclude that he was mentally competent to stand trial. It was on November 7th, 1968, John Wayne Gacy would plead guilty to one count of the sexual assault crimes against him, but denied any other allegations involving underage males. John would be convicted of the sexual assault on December 3rd of the year and sentenced to 10 years in prison. That very same day, John Wayne Gacy's wife filed for divorce and custody of their two kids and the property along with alimony. The courts ruled in favor of John's wife and the divorce was finalized on September 18th, 1989. After that, John Wayne Gacy would never see his kids or his wife again. While in prison, John would adopt the label as a model prisoner. Along with becoming head cook, he was able to increase the pay for inmates and would even help in improving conditions for the inmates along with even getting a miniature golf course installed in the recreation yard. John Wayne Gacy would then be denied parole in June of 1969. On Christmas Day of that year, John's father would die. When he received the news, John broke down crying. He then requested approval to attend the funeral, which would ultimately be denied. In 1970, on June 18th, John Wayne Gacy would be granted parole with 12 months of probation after serving 18 months of his 10-year sentence. The conditions of John's probation was that he must move back to Chicago and live with his mother and had a strict 10 p.m. curfew. A friend of John's who believed in his innocence would be the one to pick him up. During the drive, John would tell his friend that he would never go back to jail. John arrived in Chicago on June 19th, where in a short amount of time, he would get a job as a cook in a restaurant. By 1971, John Wayne Gacy would then again be charged with sexual assault of a teenage boy on the 12th of February. The courts dismissed the charge when the boy failed to appear in court. But on June 22nd of that year, John would be arrested and charged with aggravated sexual battery and reckless conduct due to the complaint of an underage male who said John Wayne Gacy had showed him a sheriff's badge and then lured him into his vehicle, where at that point, he forced the young male to perform sexual acts. Charges were ultimately dropped after evidence was brought to light that the male had attempted to blackmail John Wayne Gacy. The parole officials hadn't known about these claims, and John's parole ended in October of 1971. That year, he would establish a painting, decorating, and maintenance company, which would allow him to quit his job as a cook. John Wayne Gacy would go on to buy a ranch in Norwood Park Township that he would call home until the arrest in 1978. This would be the place that John Wayne Gacy stated that he committed all of his murders. While John resided on the property and in the community, he was a very active member of the community, and many had nothing but good things to say. 
He held parties which hosted hundreds of people and even politicians attended. Shortly after John moved into the ranch with his mother, he would go on to get engaged for the second time to a woman he had briefly dated in high school who now had two daughters. She would move into the house and shortly before the wedding, John's mom would move from the house. In 1975, John would confess to his now wife that he was bisexual. On Mother's Day of that year, John Wayne Gacy made a strange statement to his wife, saying that it was going to be the last time they had sex. After that statement to his wife, John began apparently working late, where he would return to the house in the early mornings. John's wife began to notice that him and young men would arrive to the house and enter the garage in the early hours of the morning. It was that, along with many other suspicious encounters, that would lead his wife to be curious of his going-ons. John's wife would also discover gay pornography and random men's wallets with identification. She then confronted John Wayne Gacy about her findings, where he then sternly stated that it was none of her business. She would then go on to ask John for a divorce after a heated argument, which they would agree that she would stay in the house for the time being until her and her daughters found a new place to live. It was when John Wayne Gacy would join a moose club that he would become aware of the Jolly Joker Clown Club, where the members would perform at fundraising events and entertain hospitalized children regularly. In the year 1975, John Wayne Gacy would join the Clown Club, and create his own characters, which were called Pogo the Clown and Patches the Clown. Pogo the Clown was a happy-go-lucky character, whereas Patches the Clown was a much more serious character. John Wayne Gacy would often wear his clown costume after his performances to go to a bar. It was his time as dressing as a clown that would give him the name which you all may know, the Killer Clown. Many of John's employees at his company PDM Contractors were young men, and many of them would be forced into sexual acts for promotions and many other things. John Wayne Gacy would go on to murder at least 33 young men in his lifetime. But things get a little stranger. 26 out of the 33 murder victims would be buried under his house. Many of his victims were lured to the home with the promise of a job or drugs. One of John's tricks for the young men he murdered was he would perform an escape act with handcuffs. But the thing was, there was no trick. John Wayne Gacy simply used the keys to free himself. After performing the trick, he would offer to teach the young men the escape act causing the young men to apply the cuffs to their own hands. Where at that point, John Wayne Gacy would reveal that in order to complete the trick, the key was ironically to have the key to the cuffs. The story at this point gets a lot darker and more torturous. One of his victims was a young male which had overheard John Wayne Gacy talking about the wages he paid his workers for his company. The young man's mom arrived to the pharmacy he was working at to pick him up so they can return home and celebrate her birthday as a family. The young man then told his mom that a man had a job offer for him that he was really interested in. The young man then left with John Wayne Gacy to go to his house to talk about the opportunity. It was when the young man failed to return home, his parents filed a missing persons report. At that point, officials began investigating the whereabouts of the young man, and a statement was made that the young man was most likely to be with John Wayne Gacy, due to his appearance at the young man's workplace. As officials dug deeper, they realized John had a history of crimes with young men. Officials visited the home of John and questioned him about his whereabouts, and John had a full story about his presence at the store. The store 
that the young man had worked at. John even promised officials to come to the station later that evening to make a statement. John Wayne Gacy would then arrive to the station just after 3 a.m. When he arrived, he was covered in mud, claiming he was in a car accident. Officials would later be granted a search warrant for John's home, where they would find suspicious items, which included multiple police badges, along with a pistol and a syringe. At that point, John Wayne Gacy would be placed under surveillance. One evening on December 20th, John Wayne Gacy would drive to his lawyer's office and request an alcoholic drink. A cup of whiskey was given to John, where he would then point to a newspaper article talking about the disappearance of a young man. John then said, This boy is dead. He's dead. He's in a river. John Wayne Gacy then began to confess for hours leading into the early morning. Officials then found human remains under John Wayne Gacy's house. This confession would ultimately lead to conviction of John, where he would spend 14 years on death row. During his time there, a fellow inmate stabbed Gacy in the upper arm, but Gacy would go on to receive treatment from the prison hospital. It was May 9, 1994, that John Wayne Gacy was set to be executed. He got a much easier death than any of his victims. In my opinion, he got an easier death than he deserved. Before his execution, he was granted a last meal in which he would request a picnic with his family, which consisted of a bucket of KFC, a dozen fried shrimp, french fries, along with fresh strawberries and a diet coke. It's said that leading up to John's execution, over 1,000 people gathered outside of the prison where signs said, no tears for the clown. But I'm gonna go ahead and close out today's video here. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. If you did, give it a nice big thumbs up. I really do appreciate it. I wanna thank you guys so much for all the love and support that you guys continuously give me. It means the world to me, and I will see you guys in my next video. Peace.